everyone. Welcome back to Well Versed with KI. Um, I'm going to welcome my colleagues, Rabbi Bill Hamilton, Rabbi Elizabeth Bonnie Cohen, and Rabbi David Starr. Great and, to be with you. And this week we have Parshat Shmot, um, which is a jam-packed Parsha full of the birth of Moshe, um, his his adolescent um, strivings and uh, and rising to adulthood, um, his becoming chosen or uh, becoming in relationship with God at the burning bush. One moment that really stuck out to me this week was the moment when Moshe sees the Egyptian taskmaster attacking a Hebrew slave. Um, and I just think about Moshe's um, conflicting influences in that moment. It's clear that he has a very strong intuition um, to side with the, the Hebrew slave, um, but he also has allegiance to the Egyptian community, and that's really the culture he comes from, the family he comes from. And so he's making a choice in that moment to break his allegiance to that community. Um, and as we're thinking these days about when to trust our own intuition, um, I think that we also have to grapple with questions about who we're accountable to in any given moment. So I wanted to raise that and um, invite my colleagues to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that for sure it's the turning point uh, yeah, so I'm really glad you've raised this as a text for Wellversed this week. I think that that it um, it is the moment, by design, perhaps by the Torah, to sort of put um, Moses at this fork in the road. He's either going to continue as an Egyptian <laughs> in the palace, or he's going to um, oppose that dramatically and and there is it's, it's also interesting that there is no degrees of middle ground here he's got to take side he's got to take a side and he's going to stand with the powerless and and he's going to stand for what's right and what's just which is in his bones no matter what his environment and and family and upbringing has been in the palace and that's just going to become really compelling so so in this regard, he's sort of standing apart, which is an interesting thing for us to think about today, since I think the inclination is to, to want to, to, to be attentive, uh, not just to ourselves but uh, and our principles, but to the, to the needs of those around us. Yeah, Sorry. I think what's so striking to me is that these you know at this time when moses sees this um egyptian taskmaster um essentially beating this the the hebrew slave moses feels that empathy but he doesn't know that that's like you know his people um he doesn't he doesn't know that at least not logically or, or rationally uh maybe there's something deep within him that that feels compelled by that but he's really um, experiencing him and his humanity. And it's the humanity that he identifies in this, uh, in this slave that he identifies with and that he, um, that's the source of his empathy. It doesn't seem to come from a sense of that's my, these are my people, um, right? We've, we've had that experience of like seeing, you know, seeing a fellow Jew, you know, on the, on the tea or whatever, and feeling like a sense of kinship of like, oh, that's, those are my people. That's not what Moses is experiencing here. He sees a human being being beaten and he, and he says, you're my people simply for being a human being. Um, and that sense of, of human connection is, um, is what leads him to, at all costs, um, stop this abuse, which then ultimately results in the murder of this Egyptian taskmaster, um, which, um, which is, uh, I think, an, an interesting moment where 
that that taskmaster loses his humanity, um, uh, you know, in, in kind of the flip side of that. Well, you know, it's interesting, Elizabeth, that you mean, while you're talking, it made, it made me think that, um, you know, there are three different possibilities, uh, it seems, that are on the table in terms of, you know, what, what generates a person's leadership. I mean, I'm leaving out the Machiavelli and, you know, you just want to push people around and, you know, be a CEO and run things. Um, I mean, he he's ultimately going to have this very intimate relationship with God, of course, uh, a receiver of revelation, even though that's complicated for him. But the point is, it's obviously a big part of his life as an adult. On the one hand, um, on the other hand, is this moral sense that you 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 pick up on um, that leads him to this, you know, deep sympathy and and even empathy with the suffering person. And then the third piece, which oftentimes we associate with Jewish leadership, is this kind of gut primal ethnic tribal thing. And as you pointed out, you know, for reasons probably of biography, he lacks that. Um, you know, we tend to assume that, oh, you know, Jewish leadership, that's kind of a sin qua non. You know, you have to love the Jewish people. But the point is, that's going to be a part of his trajectory that he's going to have to grow into that. And of course, he never, you know, the spoiler alert, he never totally grows into it because, of course, the Jewish people are so annoying. I mean, how could you possibly love them, uh, at least not without being, you know, vexed by them? So, I mean, it just, it's, it, it's, it, since this entire book is going to be about leadership and about nation building, I mean, it's just an interesting way to start it off by showing in some ways how far he has to come to it, to in effect, learn how to be an effective, um, even connector with fellow Israelites, much less a leader of them. Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot more there in the, in the struggle between allegiance and moral intuition and how they interact with each other. Um, with that, we will say Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.